Hi all, welcome back to my channel. So today I thought I'd do this cool little thing. So I found this. Now this is a little homemade tattoo gun by the maker creator Laura Camp. Now I'm a big fan of her channel on YouTube and I'll leave a link below, but she creates some awesome stuff. Not this stuff usually, but um, she said this was some sort of college project from when she was uh, in school. And it's a little tattoo gun made out of household items. And as soon as I saw it, I thought it looked just like something out of, say, a post-apocalyptic game, like Fallout or something like that. And I thought it would just be really cool to recreate it as a game prop. So this video isn't gonna be like a full on tutorial. It's gonna be more of a process tutorial because I expect this to take me anywhere between six to 12 hours, maybe even more than that in fact, over say maybe two or three days because I'm just gonna go in all in on detail to the point where you wouldn't actually do that for probably <laughs> this type of game asset, but it's fun to do and I just want to kind of document that whole process and kind of show you how to go about doing this if you wanted to do something similar. However, if you are looking for a full length hero prop tutorial, I have got one coming up in the pipeline, so keep your eye on my channel because that will be up soon and that is a really long tutorial and that'll be absolutely free. But this one, it would take too long for me to do this as a tutorial because this is a bit of fun for me really and a bit of an experiment too. So without further ado, let's get stuck into this. Now the first stage of this for me is going to be the blocking. I'm going to be using Maya, but it's pretty much the same in any 3D program because this is very simple and primitive modeling. Uh, now this first stage is the blocking and this will be done in a couple of passes. So the first pass, I want to try and completely ignore the fine details and just get in the major shapes of this uh, tattoo gun. That way I can judge the overall proportions of it. You know, once, once I've got every single piece in there represented as basically a primitive, I can really start to get the right scales for the different pieces in there and get it to, to kind of look right. I'm not measuring anything here or anything like that. I am just doing it freehand, but you can judge the scale of things based on the others. And if it's a little bit off, it doesn't really matter. I just want it to look good. So you'll notice that anything that's separate on the tattoo gun will be separate in my block out. So if an item is made out of two parts, I'll try and make it in two parts within reason. I don't want this to just be one homogenous block of topology because that makes it really hard to work with, to sculpt, to, to retopologize, to separate and stuff like that. It's just really difficult. And you can always come back and retopologize stuff together later on if you want to really kind of reduce that topology. But it is better at this stage to just kind of keep things separate as much as possible. Now I do go into a little bit too much detail in this first part in places, I had to keep reining myself back in because the second phase of this is the detail pass. So the first pass will just be the blocking, simple uh, geometrical shapes, really trying to keep it as simple as possible, just cubes um, and small kind of bevels and extrudes. Once I'm happy with the overall shape, then I come and do the second pass. And that's simply because there's no point spending a lot of time on fine detail only to come back and have to delete it or move it or scale something because you didn't have the overall scale right. So the simpler you can keep it right at the beginning, the better and faster the process will be. Okay, so that's the first pass of the block out, almost done. The last thing I need to do is add the tape. Now the tape is quite a large part of this uh, visually. So in a, like a, a hero prop game asset, this would probably be single sided, uh, but that makes it a little bit difficult when sculpting and kind of creating the model, the high detail model. So what I'm gonna do is actually make it double sided. So I'm gonna actually give that tape some thickness, just put a couple of bands in to represent the tape. That way it's gonna be a little bit easier for the sculpting process. And then when I come to bake this down, I'll bake it down onto a single sided poly, which we'll go over a little bit later. Okay, now that I'm completely happy with the overall scale and shape of this and that all the individual pieces have been placed in, I can now start phase two, which is to go over this entire model and add in all the detail from the images. At the same time as that, I'm also going to make this a smoothable mesh. So at this stage, you really could just take this model as is into ZBrush, DynaMesh it and just start sculpting away until you've got your final piece. But if you did that, you'd still have to try and then retopologize it to get your base mesh. I want to avoid that step by putting the detail in at this stage and then using that mesh as the low poly 
subdividing it in ZBrush and sculpting into that so that I have multiple subdivisions in ZBrush and I can export that lower subdivision level out and use that as my low poly. But to do that, it does take a lot longer within your modeling software, in this case Maya, because you have to make it smoothable within Maya so that when you subdivide it in ZBrush, it doesn't lose shape. Now, if you're very new to this whole modeling process, that might sound really complicated, but it is a very standard way of doing things. And I'll try and explain a little bit more what the subdivision means in this. So here we have a part of this model, it's just a cylinder. Now, if I hit three on the keyboard in Maya, and it might be turbo smooth in 3S Max, and I'm sure Blender has a similar thing, I don't know what that is, uh, but you can see it subdivides this just like it would do in ZBrush, and you can see that it, it loses all its shape, it goes soft around the edges and kind of just a big lump. So what we need to do is add in some restraining edges in our low poly. And what I'm gonna do is go around every sharp edge or every edge that I want to be sharp and just add another edge, top and bottom. Now, if we subdivide this, you can see that it's retained that sharp edge. And depending on how close we put those restraining edges to that edge, determines how soft or sharp it will be in the subdivided version. So that just leaves the rest of this modeling to do and finishing this stage. So I'm just gonna run through this whole model now, adding all that extra detail and making it all smoothable. Uh, and this is just basic modeling. And the only way to get better at that is just to practice in whatever program of your choice. And every time you make a model, you'll get a little bit better at that. So the more models you make and the more hours you put in every day, the faster you'll become proficient at doing this. And it is really just straightforward, good old fashioned hard surface modeling. Okay, so that brings that stage to a close. And you can see I've got my entire low poly here with the restraining edges so that it smooths properly. And you can see maybe some of it looks a little bit too high poly. That's because I've added extra edges on any long spans so that when I subdivide it in ZBrush, I get that extra bit of detail. And these can be stripped out along with the restraining edges after everything else is done. And the only bits that haven't had any restraining edges are the wood block in the middle and the two bits of lead that which are just balls because they will be completely re-sculpted in ZBrush and then re because they're more organic than the rest of the model. So let's export these to ZBrush and get sculpting for step two. Okay, I've imported my model into ZBrush and I've split to parts and that's separated every single separate item on this model into its own sub tool. So now I can go through every one of them and because we added all those restraining edges, I can subdivide it nicely and start adding all the detail I could desire. But I'm going to start off with the wooden block because that's the only piece that is going to be dynameshed from the get-go. I've already got how to sculpt stylized wood on my channel, but my next tutorial is going to have an extensive section on how to sculpt realistic wood. So if you want to learn how to do that, then keep your eye on the channel for that video. Now I will be sculpting every detail by hand on this because this for me is more of an exercise, it's more of practice. Um, but if this was a studio and it was time sensitive, then I would be using alphas, um, wood alphas and stuff like that and scans and any way possible to make this a quicker process to get to a similar end result. And on top of that as well, it'd be very unlikely that I would be going into this much detail on such a, a small model. 
if it wasn't for a portfolio or for like practice like this. So here's some tips on making tape. Now I want this tape to look like it's been wrapped multiple times around this model. So to do that, what I'm gonna do is duplicate that loop and put it on angle, maybe even duplicate it a couple of times. And even though those loops will be just singular closed loops, it will actually look like it's wrapped around as one continuous piece of tape. That's because you can't see around the whole model all at the same time. So it gives the illusion like it's an endless piece of tape when actually it's not, it's just multiple, multiple loops. Much, much easier to do. Now, if you're going to sculpt into such a thin piece of geometry like this, make sure that you put auto back face masking on. So if you go to brush on the brush that you're gonna be using, save it's clay build up tool, go to the brush menu, go to auto masking and hit back face mask. And this will stop it pulling the back face of that thin object through to the front, which is kind of tricky. You don't want back face masking on on the move tool or anything like that, but if you're using a sculpting brush, then it's best to use back face masking. Though I am trying to follow the reference images very closely, it isn't exact, and that's because I am taking a little bit of, you know, artistic license with this. Uh, if my license is still in date, I'll have to check that. But yeah, but it's not going to be exactly the same because, well, you know, it's just a little bit too much to make it a, a spot on. You know, it isn't a 3D scan of the model, and sometimes, you know, you just might want to do things to make it look a little bit better, or that you, you can't quite make out from the photographs. So. I'll just uh, kind of make those bits up how I please. So that brings us to the end of the sculpting step, which is arguably the most fun stage of this, along with the texturing, I think. And before we can get to texturing, we need to do a little bit of technical stuff. And this is kind of a long-winded, annoying part of the whole process. So I'll try to summarize it here as best I can. So at the moment we have this high detailed version and what we need to do with this is we need to get a, a a bit more of an efficient version of that out so what i'm going to do is i'm going to decimate this whole thing and export that decimated mesh so going from what is currently 32 million points we'll get that down to something like 700,000, so it's easy to use in substance painter but we also need the low poly now because this is a subdivided mesh nearly everything on this can be brought back down to subdivision one and we can export that out and use that as our low poly 
Now the reason we don't just use the low poly that we exported from Maya originally is because now that we've modeled on this and we've moved everything around a bit, um, the low poly mesh has actually changed position quite a lot. So what we can do is just export this low poly back out, uh, subdivision one back out, and use that as our new low poly, which will be quite a lot different from the original. And that way it will match up quite well with the high poly when we come to bake it in Substance Painter. We also have two other things we need to do. We need to unwrap this, which is quite a simple, straightforward process, um, just the same as you'd unwrap anything else. And we also need to retopologize both the wooden block and the new tape that we've made. And the tape will be single sided. So I'm not going to explain how to do all this process. I'll show you a few different clips and then we'll get this set up in Maya ready to go into Substance Painter. So first up, I've exported the things that I want to retopologize into 3D Coat and I'm just going to very quickly retopologize this ready for projection in Substance Painter. So I'm going to do the wooden block and I'm also going to do the tape and the tape doesn't need to be both sides it just needs to be the front and then we can um, manipulate that back in Maya so it's as close as possible to the uh, underlying mesh. So next up I've imported the new retopologization mesh into Maya along with the low poly from ZBrush. Now I've stripped out some of the supporting edge loops from this model but honestly it's best to leave most of them in until after you've done the baking process in Substance Painter because they do help support some of those details. I've also gone ahead and unwrapped the low poly on this. It's just a standard UV unwrap where I've tried to fill as much space on the UV tile as possible whilst trying to keep similar textile density across the whole model, though I have given precedent to some of the larger items on the model, as well as taking some of the tiny ones and just increasing the size of them so that they have a little bit more pixels to bake to. And I've also left myself a little bit of extra space there on the tile as well, in case I want to add anything else to this later on. So before we can move on into Substance Painter, we need to set up the low and high poly for baking. So I've imported the low poly into this and I've imported the high poly and I've set them up on two separate layers so that they sit on top of each other perfectly. This allows me to select both the high and low poly of each item and move them in exactly the same position. Now the reason I do this is because I don't want any of this stuff to intersect. Where I've got two models touching, when I bake it they will imprint information onto each other. Sometimes you might want that, but for this I actually don't, I want everything to be separate. I also add a keyframe to this so I can move back and forth between the together and the exploded version. It just makes it a little bit easier. So once that's done, you can export the low poly, just the low poly together, and also a version of it apart. You can call that low poly explode. And also a version of the high poly apart, you can call that high poly explode. Once that's done, we are ready to get baking in Substance Painter. In Substance Painter, I'm gonna start a new file and load in my low poly explode. Once I've loaded that in, I'll check it over, make sure that there's no errors and that the UVs all look correct. Then I'll go to Bake Mesh Maps and load in the High Definition Meshes section, my High Poly Explode. I'm going to then set that output size to something low, like a thousand, and just leave everything else as is, because this is just a test bake for me to see if there's anything wrong with the mesh. So once that's baked I'm going to look over the mesh and I'm just looking for any spots where it hasn't lined up any bits in the mesh that that obviously hasn't lined up because the low and high poly are too different and any seams or, or flat spots on it now you're most likely going to end up having flat spots on it and that is just where the baking mesh that envelopes the high and low poly to bake down isn't quite big enough and you can change that in the bake mesh map section now luckily for me, I didn't really come out with any errors and these small issues like seams and stuff I think will disappear mostly with a better quality output of these maps. So I'm going to go back into Bake Mesh Maps. I'm going to set the output size to 4K and the anti-aliasing to 8x8 which will take ages to bake but will get a really nice good quality set of maps for use within Substance Painter. So that pretty much brings us to the end of the steps for this. It's just texturing from this point onwards, which is pretty much the same in every video I make with texturing. The, I won't go through it in detail, but the way I like to do this is I start off with making a folder for every material that is on this item. So, you know, I've got tape, wood, metal, uh, dark metal, bright metal, um, brass and rubber, and a few other things. 
and uh, the way I do my textures is pretty much the same. Sometimes I'll, I'll use a material that's already been made if I want it to be super accurate. Sometimes I'll make my own from scratch, but I pretty much just do a base color, a highlight color, a cavity color, and then a dirt layer on top of that, or a roughness layer on top of that. I'll do that for every single item in this object. Then I'll finish up with a new folder on top of everything that will contain extra layers of dirt. So in this instance, it's ink, grime, and a little bit of glue. So here's the final render and I'm really pleased with it. I think it came out great. I added some stickers and some personal touches from Laura's channel and used Marmoset tool bag for the nice render. And I couldn't resist sticking a little item stats game UI on here just to see what it would look like in situ. So I really hope this little video has been helpful to those looking to do something similar. And if you've got any questions, leave them below or suggestions for future videos. I'm always open 
to hear them. Watch out for my next videos and I'll see you next time.